Hi, and welcome to the lecture on Vehicle Extrication and Special Rescue, Chapter 37 in your text. After you complete this chapter and related coursework, you will be able to describe and apply within context EMS rescue operations to include vehicle extrication in its 10 phases. Additionally, you will also be able to describe various specialized components of EMS ops to include tactical EMS, trench rescue, high angle rescue, and the EMT's role. The safety aspects of these operations are also discussed. Regarding the National EMS Education Standards, EMTs will have the knowledge of operational roles and responsibilities to ensure patient, public, and personnel safety. And specific to vehicle extrication, they will understand and be able to demonstrate safe vehicle extrication and use of simple hand tools. You will usually not be responsible for rescue and extrication unless you're with a fire-based EMS system that does this. Rescue involves many different processes and environments, and it requires training beyond the level of an EMT. This chapter teaches basic extrication concepts. Extrication requires mental and physical preparation. Consider the safety of yourself and your team, and safety begins with the proper mindset and proper PPE, or personal protective gear. The equipment that you use and the gear that you will wear depends on the hazards you expect to encounter, as well as what you observe during your scene size up. This protective gear may include turnouts, helmets, hearing protection, a fire extinguisher, blood and fluid impermeable gloves, leather gloves, over your disposable gloves. Vehicle safety systems can become hazards after a collision. Shock absorbing bumpers may be compressed or loaded following a front or rear end collision and they can release and injure you at your knees and legs. You should approach vehicles from the side and remember, manufacturers are required to install supplemental restraints or airbags in all new cars. Airbags are filled with a non-harmful gas or airbags fill with a non-harmful gas on impact and quickly deflate after the collision. They are located in the steering wheel and the dash in front of the passenger. Additionally, they may be located in the doors or seats. They should be deployed and deflated by the time you arrive. They have occasionally inflated while you are providing care, so you should maintain at least 5 inches of clearance around side impact airbags that have not deployed and 10 inches of clearance around driver airbags that have not deployed, as well as 20 inches of clearance around passenger side airbags that have not deployed. You need to use eye protection to protect your eyes from the cornstarch or talc that is used on airbags by the manufacturers. Your primary concern in the fundamentals of extrication is safety. Your primary roles are to provide emergency medical care, prevent further injury to the patient, and you may provide care as extrication is processing around you. Extrication is the removal from entrapment or from a dangerous situation or position. Entrapment is a term used when a person is caught within a closed area and with no way out or has a limb or other body part trapped. For the purposes of this chapter, extrication means the removal of the patient from a wrecked vehicle. As you can see here in Table 37.1, there are 10 phases of extrication, and this includes preparation, en route to the scene, arrival and scene size up, hazard control, support ops, gaining access, emergency care, patient removal, patient transfer, and termination. And we're going to talk about each of these. Preparing for an incident requiring extrication involves training for the various types of rescue situations your team may face. Rescue personnel must routinely check the extrication tools in the response vehicle, and such preparations reduce the possibility of an equipment failure at the scene of an emergency. During the en route process, you need to go over procedures and safety precautions similar to those in the phases of an ambulance call are used while we respond. Position the unit at a safe location upon arrival and activate your emergency lights. If it is a hazmat incident, park uphill and upwind from the hazard. Make sure the scene is properly marked and protected and ensure the road is closed or traffic flow is diverted. You can use cones, flares, or tape, and it is a good idea to designate somebody for traffic control. Look for passing cars before exiting your vehicle. Size up is the ongoing process of information gathering and scene evaluation to determine appropriate strategies and tactics to manage an emergency. Pay attention to downed electrical lines, leaking fluids, fire, and broken glass. It is important to identify any additional resources that will be needed, and this may include additional EMS units and personnel. Situational awareness is the ability to recognize any possible issues and act proactively to avoid a negative impact. You can evaluate the hazards and determine the number of patients by doing a 360 degree walk around of the scene. You're looking for mechanism of injury, downed electrical lines, leaking fuels or fluids, smoke or fire, broken glass, and trapped or ejected patients. 
You need to evaluate the need for additional resources such as additional extrication equipment, fire suppression, law enforcement, hazmat, utility companies, ALS, and air medical. You should also look for spilled fuel and other flammable substances, and sometimes post-crash fires get started when sparks ignite this spilled fuel. An electrical short or a damaged battery may also cause a post-crash fire. Rain, sleet, or snow can present a hazard, an additional hazard for rescue. Crashes that occur on hills are harder to handle than those that occur on level ground. Some crash scenes may present threats of violence from intoxicated persons or someone who is upset. They may pose a threat to you or others, and you should be alert for weapons. Coordinate your efforts with rescue teams and law enforcement. Communicate with members of the rescue team throughout the extrication. Start talking to the rescue team leader as soon as you arrive, and you become a member of the rescue team and will enter a vehicle and provide care for the patient when approved by the leader. The rescue team is responsible for properly securing and stabilizing the vehicle, providing safe entrance and access to the patients, and extricating any patients, as well as ensuring that patients are properly protected during extrication or other rescue activities, and also providing adequate room so that patients can be removed properly. They're also remember that EMS personnel are responsible for assessing and providing medical care, triaging and assigning patient priorities, packaging patients, providing additional assessments and care as needed once patients are removed, and providing transport to the ER. Hazard control. Law enforcement personnel are responsible for traffic control and direction, maintaining order at the scene, investigating the crash or crime scene, and establishing and maintaining lines so that bystanders are kept at a safe distance and out of the way of the rescue operation. Firefighters are responsible for fire extinguishment, prevention of any additional ignitions, ensuring scene safety, and removing spilled fuel. Downed electrical lines are a common hazard at vehicle crash scenes and you should never attempt to move them. If power lines are close to the vehicle involved in the crash, instruct the patient to remain in the vehicle until power is removed. Remain in the safe zone outside of the danger or hot zone. A hot zone is an area where individuals can be exposed to sharp metal edges, broken glass, toxic substances, lethal rays or ignition or explosion of hazardous materials. And here you see an example of the hot zone. You see where the power pole is broken and the lines are down around and on the vehicle. Family members and bystanders can become a hazard themselves. The rescue team will set up an off-limits danger zone and you should help set up and enforce this zone. The vehicle itself can also be a hazard. An unstable automobile on its side or roof can be a danger to you and rescue personnel can stabilize the car with a variety of jacks or cribbing. You should ensure that the car is in park while the parking brake is on and the ignition is turned off. The battery should also be disconnected negative side first to minimize the possibility of sparks or fire. Alternative fuel vehicles are a special concern. These vehicles may be powered by electricity and electricity slash gasoline hybrids or fuels such as propane, natural gas, methanol, or hydrogen. One common feature is the need for responders to disconnect the battery to prevent further fire or explosion. In more than 40% of today's alternative fuel vehicles, the batteries are located in the trunk or under the seats, not in the engine compartment. There may be more than one battery present. Support operations include lighting the scene, establishing tool and equipment staging areas, marking helicopter landing zones, and fire and rescue personnel work together in these functional roles. Gaining access. Gaining access to the patient is a critical phase of extrication. Make sure that the vehicle is stable and hazards are controlled. Check with the rescue leader and enter the scene only after these conditions are met. The exact way to gain access to a patient depends on the situation. It is up to you to identify the safest, most efficient access means. If there are multiple patients, you should locate and rapidly triage each one of them to determine who needs the most urgent care. In order to determine the exact location and position of the patient, consider the following questions. Is the patient in a vehicle or in some other structure? Is the vehicle or structure severely damaged? What hazards exist that pose a risk to the patient and rescuers? In what position is the vehicle? On what type of surface? Is it stable or is it apt to roll or tip? As patient's conditions change, you may have to change your course of action. Do not try to access the patient until you are sure the vehicle is stable and that hazards have been identified and rendered safe. Rapid vehicle extrication may be needed to quickly remove a patient who needs cardiopulmonary resuscitation. CPR is not effective if the patient is sitting upright or is lying on a soft car seat. In rapid vehicle extrication, you and your team may have to move a patient from inside of a vehicle to a supine position on a long board. You use the rapid extrication technique only as a last resort. 
While you are gaining access to the patient and during extrication, you must make sure that the patient remains safe. Always talk to the patient and explain the steps you are taking. All EMS personnel should wear proper protective gear. A heavy, non-flammable blanket can be used to protect the patient or EMS personnel from flying glass or other objects. A long backboard may also be used as a shield. You need to try to keep heat, noise, and force to a minimum. Here is a picture of EMTs providing rescue ops. Simple access. Your first step is simple access, trying to get to the patient as quickly and simply as possible without use of tools or breaking glass. Automobiles are built for easy entry and exit, and it may be necessary to use tools or other forcible entry methods. Enter through the doors when there is no danger to the patient. Gain access by trying to use all door handles or by rolling down the window before breaking any windows or using other methods of forced entry. The rescue team should provide the entrance you need to gain access to the patient. If the rescue team has not yet arrived, use tools like hammers, center punches, pry bars, and hacksaws. These should be available on the ambulance. Complex access requires special tools such as hand, pneumatic, or hydraulic devices. They also require special training, and this includes breaking windows or other means of entry. You can see extrication using jaws and other, other essential tools here. Providing medical care to a patient who is trapped in a vehicle is principally the same as for any other patient. Once interest and access to the patient have been provided and the scene is safe, perform a primary assessment and provide care for, before further extrication begins. Provide manual stabilization to protect the spine and open the airway. Provide high flow oxygen and assist or provide for adequate ventilation. You should control any significant external bleeding and treat all critical injuries. Good communication among team members and clear leadership are essential to safe, efficient provision of proper emergency care. One member must be clearly in charge. The team leader's assessment will indicate how medical care packaging and transport are to proceed. Customarily, the senior medical person takes this role. A lack of identifiable leadership at the scene hinders the rescue effort and patient care. Leaders should be identified as part of a larger incident command system and they should be medically trained and qualified to judge the priorities of patient care. They must be experienced in extrication as well. Patient removal. Rescue personnel should coordinate with you to determine the best removal route. Removal of a patient from a motor vehicle is a multi-step process that requires many rescuers, equipment, and time. It requires the use of a variety of complex hand and power tools and specialized education is also required. You should participate in the preparation for patient removal. Table 37.2 lists some standard vehicle extrication techniques. Brake and gas pedal displacement, dash rolls, door removal, roof opening and removal, seat displacement, steering column displacement, and steering wheel cut. Determine how urgently the patient must be extricated. Determine where you should be positioned to best protect the patient. And after the patient has been extricated, determine how you will move the patient to the backboard and then to the stretcher. Carefully examine trapped patients or limbs to determine the extent of injury. If possible, evaluate sensation in the trapped area. Your input is essential to the rescue team to ensure that the patient's injuries are considered. Reevaluate whether the patient needs rapid extrication. In most cases, it is impractical to apply extremity splints within the vehicle. Extremity injuries can generally be supported and immobilized while the patient is being moved. Secure a fractured arm to the patient's side and secure a fractured leg to the other leg. Once the plan is in place, you should determine how best to protect the patient. Often, you will be placed in a vehicle alongside the patient and be sure you are wearing protective gear. Your safety and the patient's safety are paramount and both should be covered by a thick, flame-resistant blanket. Appropriate hearing protection should also be worn. Patient transfer. Perform a complete primary assessment once the patient has been freed and any other previously inaccessible patients have been freed. Make certain the spine is manually stabilized and apply a C collar if this has not already been done. Move the patient in a series of smooth, slow, controlled steps with designated stops to allow for repositioning and adjustments. Position each EMT for a smooth, controlled transfer. One person should be in charge of the move. Choose a path that requires the least manipulation of the patient and equipment. Make sure that sufficient personnel are available and make sure that everyone knows to move on your command. Move the patient as a unit. Resist the temptation to move the immobilization device and continue to protect the patient from any hazards. Once the patient has been placed on the stretcher, continue with any additional assessment and treatment that was deferred. And you can see this process going on here. Termination involves returning emergency units to service. All of the equipment used on scene must be checked before reloading onto the apparatus, and you should check and clean your ambulance or rescue gear thoroughly, replacing anything that you used. 
Rescue and medical units are required to complete all necessary reports. Now we're going to talk about some specialized rescue situations. Sometimes a patient can only be reached by teams trained in special technical rescues. Specialized skills of the teams include cave rescue, confined space rescue, cross field and trail rescue like park rangers, and dive rescue. We also see lost person search and rescue, mine rescue, mountain rock and ice climbing rescue, ski slope, cross country or trail snow rescue like ski patrol, and structural collapse rescue. There's also tactical medics and special weapons and tactics SWAT teams, technical rope rescue, both low and high angles, trench rescue, water and small craft rescue, and whitewater rescue. A technical rescue situation may contain hidden dangers. Personnel need special technical skills to safely enter and move around, and it is not safe to include personnel who do not have the proper training. A technical rescue group is trained and on call for certain types of technical rescues and they are made up of individuals from one or more departments. Many members of technical rescue groups are also trained as emergency medical responders or EMTs. Check with the incident commander to make sure the technical rescue group has been summoned and is en route. Incident command is the individual who has overall command of the scene and in the field. If there is no incident commander present, follow your local guidelines. If the rescue site is a long distance from the ambulance, take a long backboard or a basket stretcher. Be sure to take all of the carry-in kits and other equipment you may need to treat and immobilize your patient. Set up your equipment at a stable location where you will be able to treat your patient and perform your primary assessment as soon as the rescue team brings you the patient. Packaging and carrying the patient back to the ambulance requires a joint effort between EMTs and the technical rescue team, and you may consider use of an air medical unit if the patient will need to be carried or transported an extensive distance. distance. Lost Person Search and Rescue An ambulance is usually summoned to the incident command post when a person is lost outdoors and a search effort is initiated. Your job is to stand by at the command post until the lost person or people have been found. As soon as you are briefed on the situation, isolate and prepare the equipment you may need. Leave the prepared equipment in the back of the ambulance to protect it from weather. You may be asked to stay with family members of the lost individual and you should gather any medical history and communicate to those in charge. Only the incident commander should communicate any news or progress of the search to the family. Set your radio at a discreet volume. Once the lost person is found, you will be instructed where and when to meet up with the search team to provide treatment. Ensure that the carry-in equipment is evenly distributed among providers and ensure that a pace is maintained that all can keep up with. Time and effort can sometimes be eased by relocating the ambulance or by using an ATV. Trench Rescue Many cave-ins and trench collapses have poor outcomes for victims. Collapses usually involve large areas of falling dirt that weigh approximately 100 pounds per cubic, feet, cubic foot. Victims with thousands of pounds of dirt on their chest cannot fully expand their lungs and may become hypoxic. The risk of a secondary collapse is a concern to rescue personnel and EMTs. Safety measures can reduce the potential for injury. Response vehicles need to be at least 500 feet from the scene, and all vehicles should be turned off to avoid a secondary collapse caused by vibrations. All road traffic should be diverted from the 500-foot safety area. Other hazards include downed electrical wires and broken glass or water lines. Construction equipment at the collapse site may be unstable and could fall into the cave-in or trench site. Witnesses to the incident should be identified and may be valuable in providing information on the number of victims and their locations. Non-trapped individuals should be assisted from the area. At no time should medical or rescue personnel enter a trench deeper than four feet without proper shoring in place. During the extrication of any live victims, medical personnel trained in cave-in and trench collapse rescue will provide most of the medical care. And you should be prepared to receive patients once they have been extricated from the site. Tactical Emergency Medical Support A steady increase in violence throughout the country has resulted in EMTs taking precautions to ensure personal safety. Normally, when there is a potential for violence in present, responding units should wait until the scene is secured by law enforcement. Sometimes a SWAT team is needed to secure an area, and this occurs sometimes with hostage incidents, barricaded subjects, and snipers. Many communities have incorporated specially trained EMTs, paramedics, nurses, and even physicians into police SWAT units. They provide a special level of care to the sick and the injured, and their training goes well beyond the practices seen in standard emergency medical care. When called to the scene of a law enforcement tactical situation, determine the location of the command post and report to the incident commander for instructions. Lights and sirens should be off and outside radio speakers should not be used when nearing the scene. The command post is usually located in a safe zone and you should not stray far from this zone. 
Organization is the key. Have the incident commander identify the specific location of the incident. Plan a location to meet up with SWAT members if an injury occurs. Designate primary and secondary helicopter landing zones if your region uses air medical. And remember, the quickest route to the closest hospital burn center and trauma center should be identified. Structure fires. Generally, an ambulance is dispatched with the fire department apparatus to any structure fire. A fire in a house, apartment building, office, school, plant, warehouse, or other building is considered a structure fire. And you should determine whether an alternate route is needed because of the fire. Ask the incident commander where the ambulance should be staged. It should be far enough away from the fire to be safe, and it cannot block or hinder other arriving equipment. It cannot be blocked in, and it should be close enough to be visible so patients can be brought to it easily. Determine if there are any injured patients or whether you've been called to stand by. One or more ambulance may have been dispatched to the scene. Search and rescue in a burning building requires special training and equipment. Operations are performed by teams of firefighters wearing full turnout gear and self-contained breathing apparatus, or SCBA. They carry tools and hose lines, and these teams will bring patients out of the burning building to the area where the ambulance is. You should always remain with the ambulance unless you are otherwise instructed, and after the fire is out, do not leave because you may have to treat an injured firefighter. The ambulance should leave only if transporting a patient or if the incident commander has released you. Sometimes a scene may be further complicated by the presence of hazardous materials. A hazardous material is any substance that is toxic, poisonous, radioactive, flammable, or explosive and can cause injury or death with exposure. Hazardous materials pose a threat to you and to others at the scene, as well as a much larger area and population. You should follow additional procedures outlined in Chapter 38, Incident Management. In summary, you must be prepared mentally and physically for any incident that requires rescue or extrication. Vehicle safety systems, such as shock-absorbing bumpers and airbags, protect your patients but also have the potential to injure rescuers. The ten phases of extrication are preparation, en route to the scene, arrival and scene size up, hazard control, and support operations, gaining access, emergency care, patient removal, patient transfer, and termination. The rescue team is responsible for securing and stabilizing vehicles, providing safe entrance and access to patients, extricating patients, and protecting patients during extrication. EMS personnel are responsible for assessment, medical care, triage, packaging, and transport. In some situations, the patient can only be reached by teams trained in special technical rescues, and these teams can include cave rescue, confined space rescue, cross-field and train rescue like park rangers, dive rescue, lost person search and rescue, mine rescue, mountain rock and ice climbing rescue, ski slope and cross-country or trail snow rescue like ski patrols, and structural collapse rescue, special weapons and tactics team, technical rope rescue, both low and high angle, trench rescue, water and small craft rescue, and whitewater rescue. As always, thanks for your attention during this lecture, and we are getting to the shorter ones now. If you have any questions or concerns, please talk to your instructor during your face-to-face -face portion of the class.